elements of a SNES engine. This video has two parts. The first part I'm going to explain the V blank and the CRT cycle. In the second part I'm going to talk about the three main loop options of the SNES. With a deep dive into the most common one and explain all the traps. So even if you already know about V blank and understand how it works then skip to the next part. Even if you already have a working loop, I highly recommend you watch my walkthrough as there are a lot of traps and I have not seen a tutorial cover them, so you'll probably still gain some info. On to the first part. The first thing you need to understand is how the PPU and V-Blank rule the roost. I've seen a lot of newcomers come in without understanding this. You may think the CPU is in charge, so you set up your frame and then you tell the PPU to draw it. This is not the case. There is no frame buffer as in a bitmap based computer, but the frame is actively drawn live. This means the PPU draws what it has when it needs to. So every 60th or 50th, depending if you are NTSC or PAL based, the frame starts drawing. If you are ready or not, it will start to draw, and then a 60th or 50th later, it will start again. You can't slow it down, you can't pause it, you can't control it. Well, you can turn it off. Every 60th or 50th, it happens. You get a V-blank, and then the screen will start to draw. And you have to be ready, or you drop it. If you are not from the CRT era, I highly recommend you watch the slow-mo guys video, link down below in the description so you can see it happen. The PPU marches down the screen line by line at a constant, unwavering rate. The frame starts at the top, draws a line, then retreats back to the left side, then the next line retreats back, next line. It will do this for 224 lines. I'm assuming 224 line mode for all of this. And then it slowly makes its way back up to the top. And this takes the same amount of time it would take to draw 38 lines. On a PAL machine, the screen actually has more lines. But the SNES doesn't show them and treats them as if the beam is going back up the screen only it keeps on drawing nothing for 50 lines, then slowly retreats for 38 lines. The dotted lines form what is known as blanking, i.e. the raster beam is turned off. The right to left, a H blank, the bottom to top is V blank. To recap, on NTSC 224 lines mode, you have 224 lines of active screen followed by 38 lines worth of v-blank time in which to make your updates. On PAL 224 lines mode you have 224 lines of active screen followed by 88 lines worth of v-blank. Thus on an NTSC SNES you can DMA up to 5.9k per v-blank. On a PAL SNES, up to 14k per V-Blank. These limits will haunt you, I promise. Now to understand the implications of this, we need to look at the parts of the SNES. We have the 5A22 CPU, 128k of work RAM, the PPU, 64k of video RAM, color graphics RAM, and object attribute memory. SBC 700 with 64k of audio RAM. The CPU has full access to WRAM, the PPU and SBC 700 at all times. However, access to VRAM, CG RAM and OAM is restricted to blanking periods only. The SNES won't warn you about the gates to said RAM closing it will just throw all your data against the wall and not say anything. 
This means you don't update the PPU state live. During the active frame, you generate all of your changes and modifications to the PPU and VRAM state. Then when VBlank happens, push all your updates to the PPU and VRAM. Typically, you will just mirror OAM as you will probably want to update most of it each frame. CG RAM depends on what you are doing, but you are more likely to want to just push a new value here and there rather than all 512 bytes. But for simplicity, you might just mirror the lot and send all of it when needed. VRAM updates such as new screen map data, new screen frames, etc. you will want to do as a stack buffer that you pile up all your changes and then in VBlank you then walk through them and make your sparse updates. But how do you sync your updates with VBlank? The SNES gives you three main options. The NMI only. This is the simplest form and for lack of a better term, classical format. For example, Super Mario Brothers on the NES and a lot of other NES games work this way. The NMI routine, just bit $4.10, you do your VRAM, your ORAM, your CG RAM updates, you scan the pads, you do your game logic, you RTI. The main game loop is just jump main game, it doesn't do anything. This way you only have one thread and everything is synced to the frame. While your game runs in one frame, this is perfectly adequate. The SNES offers the inverse of this, the no NMI. Main game, you just WAI, wait for the interrupt, then you bit 4210, do your VRAM, ORAM, CG RAM updates, you scan your pad, you do your game logic, and then you jump main game. Basically does the same thing, just make sure you don't set up any IRQs in this method though. The two thread system. Here you have the NMI deal with your VRAM updates and pad reading, and the main loop updates the game logic. So you bit 4210, do VRAM, OM, CG RAM, scan the pad, set NMI done flag, and then RTI. And then your main game, you load the NMI done flag, keep looping until it's changed, update your game logic, reset the done flag, and then jump the main game. Note how I set NMI done flag last. This allows you in your NMI routine to check to see if the frame is ready for update. You don't want to update a partial frame, that will lead to glitching. Although you may want to put it part way through the logic, once you have updated all the VRAM mirrors and you are doing other tasks such as updating the music and sound effects, unpacking blocks for further along in the map, which if they spill over don't affect the frame integrity and are safe to be interrupted by the NMI. Personally, I feel the first two on the SNES are fine for quick demos, testing, but not something you should really use on a game. The third method is not really that much harder to deal with and will serve you better in the long run. It does come laden with traps, however, as does everything on the SNES. So let's walk through an example and I'll explain and disarm all of them for you. This is for low ROM. I'll start with the NMI portion of the routine. The NMI will always start in bank zero. So we need to jump long to a fast bank. The JML changes the program bank, but not the data bank. So the data bank is still slow. Also, we don't know what the data bank is. Maybe the code was interrupted has changed it to somewhere else. If the NMI ready flag is in the shared 8K of RAM, it's 99.5% safe. However, if the data bank is set to 7F, it will fail. So, push the data bank to save it, push the program bank, pull it into the data bank so we match and have a known value. Now we want to test a flag 
to make sure we are safe. So I make sure A is 8 bits. First, however, I act the NMI. If this doesn't happen, we won't get any more V blank NMIs, which will lock the game up. Note, I use bit. The register just has to be read. And bit has the benefit of not changing any CPU registers. Now we bit the NMI ready flag. Note I put an F on the end, so I know while coding that this is a negative active flag. I also have PF for positive flag, NZ for not zero, and EZ for equal zero. Also notice the at W. This is the 64 TAS way of forcing 16-bit addresses. It is dot W in WLADX, and I believe also in CA65. Why do I do this? Because we don't know where the direct page is. You could also make sure the NMI ready NF is not in a direct page variable. However, this way, should it be or not be, we are safe. Now, if it is still negative, we know we have not completed the last frame, and we exit. So we restore the data bank and RTI. The interrupt system and RTI save and restore the processor status flags as part of their internal operations, so we don't need to save and restore the processor flags, which also includes the size of CPU registers. If we are still on this code, then we are ready to do a vblank update, now, I need A, X, and Y to be 16 bits for preservation. We save A, X, Y, and then direct page register. We need to load a known value to be safe and ensure the DP accesses actually go where we expect. I'm assuming zero here, but it can be anywhere, just as long as you know that it is where it should be. Now you are ready to run your update code. DMA, OAM, update the tile map, update PPU registers, etc. Now we leave. A needs to be 8 bit for setting the flag. I load a negative number. I just chose FF. And then we store it in NMI ready and F. Now, since I have DP at 0, it is safe to do without the at W. If you move it elsewhere, and that elsewhere is not in the DP, you may wish to add the at W. You could also do a deck if you wanted to save two bytes, but it will actually be slightly slower than the immediate load store combo. Restore DP, Y, X, and A, so reverse order, the data bank, and exit. That is all for this video. In the next video, I'll be looking at how to properly start and boot up the SNES.